Welcome everyone to Spatial Statistics, a theoretical overview. This is a workshop session that will provide an overview of spatial statistics, how such analyses are conducted, and the application of spatial statistics in nutrition research. We wish to inform you that this session is being recorded for potential publishing on our symposium website. Please modify your name and or shut off your video if you do not wish to be recorded. We ask that all attendees keep their audio off until the audience-led question and answer period at the end of the session. Our presenters for this session are Dr. Sumita Srinivasan and Ashwarya Venkat. Dr. Sumita Srinivasan's research interests are at the intersection of sustainable development and spatial inequities of access. She applies spatial analytic methods to issues related to public health, transportation, land use, and infrastructure. Ashwarya Venkat is a current doctoral student at the Friedman School in Agriculture, Agricultural Food and Environment. Her research applies geospatial techniques to study the intersection of extreme weather events, food prices, and nutrition. And with that, we will begin with Dr. Srinivasan. I wanted to thank you, uh, Brianne and Ryan, for inviting me to talk. And I, it's always a pleasure uh, to be in the company of uh, students from the Friedman School and others interested in spatial statistics. Um, so um, what is spatial statistics? So I could probably go into um, a great deal of depth about formulas and things, but I just wanted to give you a sort of everyday view of how it could be useful in the kinds of research that you might do, or even at work, or you know, doing any kind of project which involves data. So um, I'll talk a little bit by definition. I mean, what is spatial statistics? And then we'll talk about spatial data analysis in general, um, exploratory spatial data analysis, and then more descriptive spatial statistics. And finally, a few of the sort of ways in which you could use predictive models that have spatial data. So traditional statistics is inherently non-spatial. I'm sure the first statistics class you went to had a bunch of tables that you did all kinds of useful things with. Uh, but what's uh, different about spatial statistics is that it extends that non-spatial representation to maps. Uh, and so here, obviously, uh, we're interested in how things are spatially distributed. Um, so, for example, I think a week or two ago, I was starting to look at some of these data uh, on mortality rates by uh, over time for the U.S. by county, and I was looking at tables like this, and then I went on to start doing some preliminary mapping to explore the data, which looked like this. So, clearly, giving you very different ways of understanding uh, or maybe even creating hypotheses. So what does spatial data analysis look like? Well, you're converting data into information. Obviously, you're coming into it, you're exploring it, you want to create some hypotheses, perhaps, you want to test them later, um, but location matters. So you should only do it when you think location matters or you have some kind of hypotheses about these. So this, when I mean spatial, doesn't mean necessarily just geospatial. It could be any spatial. So this is kind of, I thought, a cool paper looking at spatial statistics in basketball. So here they're looking at high and low incidence clusters of shots, and this is a basketball court, and they're comparing a couple of players, I think Kobe Bryant and Lamar Odom. So spatial doesn't mean on Earth alone or Mars alone or somewhere that you recognize. It could also mean something that is spatial, but not maybe what you thought was spatial. So spatial data types include points, lines, and polygons. Uh, here you can see examples of all of those. They also include rasters, uh, which are more like images. And it involves doing some, some form of GIS analysis, perhaps, or uh, geodata analysis, or geoprocessing, if you will. And so it could include all of these geocoding queries, understanding proximities, overlays, uh, digitizing new data. And you can do this in open source software these days. So you can do it in R or Python. And you can also do it in software that you pay money for, like ArcGIS or free GIS software, like QGIS. And so the 
of the ways in which they integrate spatial statistical analysis in the software can vary. So there's one software called Geoda, which I really like. Because it's very light and it's open source, and you can immediately immediately start mapping and using spatial statistics. So that has a pretty uh, good integration. Uh, there's also loose integration, so uh, you can do stuff in R and then take it into ArcGIS or QGIS for visualization. Um, and so there's also um, closed integration these days, like you can have a bridge into R from ArcGIS. You could use ArcGIS notebooks to do Python uh, within ArcGIS. So another example from sports here is when you first start looking at spatial data, the kinds of things you might do. And here they're looking at how the birthplaces of uh, baseball players has changed in terms of the centroid of where they were born. And that link, if I uh, had more time, I'd go there and it's kind of cool, uh, but I definitely recommend that you explore it. They do it for all kinds of sports, not just baseball. So what does exploratory spatial data analysis involve? We just started to do that with looking at the movement of baseball players, birthplaces over the country over time, but you could also do it in the case of this by looking at the standard sort of scatter plots, right? We're looking at how are several of these variables correlated. In this case, uh, this was an analysis about COVID-19 incidents in Massachusetts. And so the student started looking at, well, let's look at how these variables interact. Uh, we can look at correlations, we can look at the PC plot, and then we can look at particular high incidence locations. So you're linking and brushing across the data to see where they are. And then finally looking at those place names and maybe having a few theories about why it's high in places like Chelsea or Revere or Worcester, for example. Then when you've developed some of those hypotheses uh, or beginning to develop some of those hypotheses, you could look at your data using some descriptive spatial statistics like what one example is local Moran's eye where it shows high, high or low, low clusters. And again, here I'm looking at income um, and so uh, I, or housing value or you know, you, any number of things that you might be interested in and looking at say, for example, in these, scatter plot here that there are particular towns that have relatively high income and surrounded by high income. Or uh, you can look at it in the map up there as well, where you see high surrounded by uh, low. And so there are different ways in which you can apply some of these uh, spatial statistics without you know, any models. You're just looking at the data. You can also do different kinds of point pattern analysis. You're looking at Beijing, um, house sales, and then seeing that they are very clustered to, to the sort of more central parts uh, of the uh, city. You could also look at things over time. So here's some crime data in San Francisco over a period of one year, and we're looking at where crime tends to congregate. So once you have a sense of descriptively, this is what my data are, you probably have a few hypotheses and then you might then use spatial statistical uh, say, re uh, uh, regressions or regressions that use spatial statistical um, analysis in a sense. And here are a few examples of that. So here I'm trying to estimate what's the uh, sort of prevalence of airborne particles or PM uh, in California. I've only measured it at these measuring stations, not I, but uh, the California Air Resources Board, board has measured those. And so you can see that there are, there's a tendency to be relatively high close to some of these places like Fresno and Sacramento. And when you interpolate it, which is a spatial statistical technique, you get a better sense of how are uh, particulate matter distributed over California. And these estimates come with the usual things, confidence intervals. So we have a better sense of where the problem areas are and how wrong we might be in our estimates of them. Here's another example from Chennai in India, where we've done a case study, a set of surveys uh, at different uh, locations in the uh, city where we went and asked questions about, well, how do you, you know, how do you spend money on all of these different things that you do every day? 
that use up energy in some way. That includes transportation, that includes fuel, that's a lot of related things. And so when you come up with something aspatial like this, it's not often evident to everyone, uh, what does this mean? Like, yes, some parts of the city have higher bars, some parts of the city have lower bars, but what would it look like on a map? And so that's where the spatial statistics could be useful. So here, remember I was talking about local Moran's eye earlier, I can see where the high, high clusters are, the reds here, and then I can see the low, low clusters. This is high surrounded by high energy expenditure is red, low surrounded by low energy expenditure is blue. And that's interesting because in this city, uh, you know, it also sort of parallels where the relatively wealthy are congregating, which is in the southern part um, and somewhat in the middle. And then the northern part has become uh, relatively lower income. Um, so those are places of interest, which you can then run the standard regression models, which tell you that even after controlling for income and education, as we have here, we find that uh, even after controlling for the spatial autocorrelation that you're seeing with those clusters, um, you know, places which have low energy usage are surrounded by low energy usage and places with high are surrounded by high, even controlling for that, we're seeing that, you know, some of these are significant in predicting the ways in which households are spending on energy. Now, another example here is, again, this looks aspatial. This is simply doing a principal component analysis with a lot of spatial attributes describing places in a city called Chengdu in China. And so the first component of that is this. And yes, by looking at this, we can say something about, well, let's see, let's look at distance to metro that is positively correlated. The jobs housing ratio is negatively correlated. Uh, the built up area is negatively correlated. And so that gives us a sense that this is some kind of measure of urbanicity. Um, and so we call it a suburban, suburban factor. And so here is the first component that we mapped. Uh, and mapping, again, again, gives us a lot of ideas about, oh, these cities are mostly surrounding uh, and they are you know, uh, along mostly uh, the south and along the uh, west. So what does that mean? What kinds of places are these? So Chinese cities are somewhat different from US cities in the sense that this is the city center, looks like most city centers, uh, but this is on the edge. So this is a suburban location, but it's pretty dense, has all these towers full of housing. So the ways in which we can understand how people behave in terms of how they choose to travel can be quite different than they look in the US. In the US, it would be straightforward. It would say low density, less likely to use the bus uh, or train because also they don't have access to it. So it was useful to interpolate the probability that they would choose a particular mode like bus versus car and finding these patterns here and looking for those same places. It's different in the city center. It's different in some of the places which look like this where you might still have a pretty high probability that they would choose a bus. Um, then to more recent work where we're looking at, at figuring out how places are different across Massachusetts here. Now we're looking at um, within, this, within the state, we're trying to predict uh, opioid abuse, uh, or in this case, actually, in this particular case, overdose deaths. Uh, and we found that, again, many of these places uh, have highly correlated factors, like you know the kinds of people that live there and uh, their distance to things like gas station, or a fast food restaurant, which is the closest uh, restroom, um, distance to pharmacy, all of these are uh, somewhat spatially clustered in a sense, and also clustered across places that are you know, uh, next to each other. So when we map these components, uh, again, strangely enough, you saw the parallel in Chengdu where we saw this idea of suburbanity, you see that in Massachusetts as well. So you see that the western parts of the state are more ex exurban uh, than the closer to Boston parts. But poor access is interesting because you're seeing this brown, which is in the western, some of the western parts, which are pretty far 
more rural, far from highways uh, and other amenities, but you also see them within Boston. So close to the city center, you find parts, maybe Roxbury, Dorchester, which have really poor access. And then a third component, which we thought was interesting, was the presence of males. And then we run models like everybody else. Uh, we also control for spatial autocorrelation, hence the spatial that you see there. And we continue to see that these are all significant in predicting uh, overdose rates. And it's persistent over time to an extent. So being exurban, having poor access, high male presence are all predicting um, a higher overdose rates in Massachusetts. Um, and that is persisting till 2017 when the high male presence goes away. What's interesting here, though, I think, is this access is really the biggest predictor of overdose deaths. And so the anecdotal sort of idea about overdoses is, oh, it's happening out there in the suburbs. Uh, it's mostly white uh, or poor, but that's not necessarily true. It is really about access in some sense. And so I think that was fascinating. Now, other ways in which you can look at the same kinds of data, which we did. Uh, of course, we're looking at it over time here. We would call this an aspatial regression in a sense. Poverty is was significant in predicting opioid uh, abuse, OUD disorder. And uh, you can see that it was significant all the way till 2013, and then it dropped off. It's no longer significant in 2014 and 15. Uh, but when we used geographically weighted regressions and found that while it may not be significant in the overall data in Massachusetts, it's still significant in different parts uh, of Massachusetts in a more sort of severe way. So Western Massachusetts has a much higher coefficient. Um, so poverty had a stronger effect in predicting opioid uh, use disorder. And even in 2015, where it was no longer significant in the models that you see here, uh, it was still significant in the Western parts of the state. In fact, the parts of the state where it was no longer significant were driving the overall model, uh, which wasn't necessarily true for the rest of the state. So uh, lastly, I want to go back to basketball. And you can see again, here also you can do predictive models and where you can see uh, one of these basketball players has is really effective at stopping the uh, rim shot or any kind of shot for that matter, uh, Chris Paul. So that's my sort of quick survey of spatial statistics. And I will let Ash uh, do the rest of uh, this sort of introduction to it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sumita. Thank you all. Uh, and thank you, Sumita, for that excellent introduction. So good morning, everyone. I'm Ash, and um, I'm a doctoral student, uh, as we mentioned, it, at the Friedman School. Um, and I think I will be, yeah, I'll be presenting today about spatial statistics in practice. So I will skip over, here's just an outline of, um, of my presentation. I'll skip through some of the tools of the trade and key methods, since Sumita has already covered that. Um, but I will start with a broad overview of some of the foundations, um, and then I'll dive into an example from my own research, um, so you can kind of see a work in progress a little bit. Um, and then I'd like to end by uh, discussing some lessons and resources to continue uh, learning more about spatial statistics, if you are interested. Great. So I wanted to take a step back. Uh, a little bit uh, before we dive into techniques and you know applied examples and so on, and think a little bit more carefully about why we do what we do, right? So if you are here, you're likely interested in spatial statistics and spatial thinking. And I want to reinforce that this whole exercise of spatial statistics is a study of objects, trajectories, processes, phenomenon, and how they're all related. Um, so you saw examples today from, you know, things uh, as diverse as, you know, basketball court uh, movements, as well as, you know, uh, opioid uh, abuse patterns in Massachusetts. So space can mean a lot of things. Um, and we're in the business of looking at how space, making sense of space, essentially. Um, this sounds very abstract, but really, again, it can be anything. Um, and space is just a first level descriptor, right? So really, uh, it's a building block to establish how features are related. 
uh, in the form of distributions, which, you know, uh, statistical distributions, of course, have their own properties, um, but also hierarchies and networks and surfaces. All of these are ways of thinking about and visualizing and modeling space. Um, yeah. So it's always good, of course, to start with a few laws to kind of lay out the field a little bit. So the first guiding principle of this field was set out by Tobler in 1970. Um, and it says that everything is related to everything else, but near things are more related than distant things, right? So this principle is, of course, evident in the natural environment. Uh, for example, if you think about mountain ranges or species ex extents, climatological boundaries. Uh, but as you've seen today, it can also apply to, you know, urban, urban spaces, cities, how we, you know, build. And also things that we might not be readily able to observe, such as, you know, health crises. Um, yeah, a lot of these are... Uh, it's different based on what kind of spatial data you have, of course, um, but a lot of it can mean a lot of things, right, in, in geography. So the second law was developed by Michael Goodchild, and it says geographic variables exhibit uncontrolled variance. So this, of course, introduces the idea of spatial heterogeneity, which allows us to use traditional statistics um, and apply them to, to spatial questions uh, to see if it if a variable or some kind of phenomenon is correlated with itself or with other uh, covariates over space. Um, and in doing, in using these principles and asking these questions, we begin formulating equations and hypotheses tests to measure correlation um, and how things vary over time. And keep in mind that our null hypotheses in this field are always, uh, is, is it random? Um, if, uh, if we conduct any hypothesis test or spatial analysis, right, we're comparing our results to known or expected spatial randomness. So if, you know, if the US uh, population density or elevation was actually random, right, it would look like the column on the right, but we know that it isn't. Um, and we can begin examining, examining any deviations from this expected randomness um, to think about what is driving the patterns that we observe. Um, and yeah, dig into the analysis a little bit. So of course, before we embark on any of the analysis, we have to have a desired outcome in mind. Uh, the first decision in that is deciding whether you want the analysis to be descriptive, diagnostic, predictive, or prescriptive. Uh, predictive analysis, uh, as Sumita mentioned, is a little different in that you're using, using your known to uh, estimate an unknown uh, using a diagnostic model. Um, and prescriptive analyses is, of course, the most involved uh, because you have to figure out exactly what should happen using some kind of simulation or experiment. Um, but the descriptive and the diagnostic uh, is a little bit more familiar and routinely done across all of the analyses. And of course, spa all spatial analyses roughly follow the same workflow. So you start with collecting data, developing a model, validating the model somehow, and then making a decision based on the model. And I would argue that the most important step, which is not in this diagram, is uh, collecting and extracting the right data from the right source uh, for the right spatial and temporal extent and the right resolution that you are interested in to answer your research question. So this takes the most time, of course, um, if you, this might be fairly straightforward depending on your spatial scale. So if you're working with a city, for example, and a lot of the data is readily available, that's excellent. But if you're working with remote sensing data, climatological data, or data from panel surveys, for example, you might actually need to compile a lot of the data and do a lot of pre-processing to get your data uh, in the right format to begin asking the spatial questions and developing models. So it's good to keep in mind you know, that this process, this workflow is not linear, it's iterative, um, and it is very much worth doing uh, to, to get to the correct model and the correct answer for your question. So I'll skip over a lot of these. You'll get the slides eventually. So um, you'll have a lot of these uh, to refer back to if you're interested. Um, but of course, there are a lot of different ways of going about uh, you know, building spatial models. And I'll dive into one example of how I'm attempting to do that in my research. So I'll start by introducing some of our research questions and hypotheses. So our big question, uh, for the sequence of papers is how resilient are retail food prices? So our outcome of interest uh, is of course retail food prices um, and we're interested in retail prices as an indicator of food system performance at the consumer end of supply chains. 
So we know that retail prices uh, better represent the additional share of a consumer dollar going towards either transportation or storage to provision food at the market. Um, and we know that spikes in retail food prices are especially costly for the world's poorest people. So the impacts to net welfare that we measure using retail food prices are actually uh, pretty important. Um, in this analysis, we're also partitioning the data set by food groups. Uh, you'll see that in a, in a little bit when I present some of the data, um, but really we're interested in the difference between uh, dry cereal and uh, grains compared to comparing these, uh, this food group to other food groups such as uh, fruits and vegetables, dairy and animal source foods, which are bulky and perishable. So this means each group potentially has a different supply chain um, and you know, dried grains and cereals are traded uh, internationally, whereas some of the other food groups are traded at a much smaller regional or local scales. So lots of different commodities that we're working with here. And the last component of this analysis is extreme weather events. So we're looking at five different extreme weather events um, with mixed effects to, uh, to the retail price of different foods. So some events might uh, cause lower incomes if customers, uh, you know, either uh, lose their wages or they switch to non-perishable food items to consume at home. Uh, lower supply of certain foods could also be due to labor constraints or limited wholesale supplies. So our analysis is purely empirical. We are measuring the net effect of a lot of different forces at play here. So the spatial questions specifically that we're interested in is uh, by looking at markets, how integrated are markets? So how, to what degree does a market reflect, uh, you know, price in its location versus a nearby location? And to what degree is the price in one market affected by the price maybe in the nearest city, in the most populated city, right? The nearest port city, which connects that market to the rest of the world. Um, and in general to the rest of the world. So if a major food food crisis happens uh, somewhere else in the world, uh, is your average market going to respond to that? Um, and finally, do we, um, in, in all of our models, is there a difference between the spatial model versus the traditional OLS uh, regression model? Um, unfortunately, I don't have results to present to you today, but it is something we are pursuing and uh, interested in exploring. So here's just a quick introduction to the data set. So we derived this data set by combining retail price observations from three different early warning sources. Uh, those are the three acronyms that you see here. Uh, the continuous study period of the analysis is 2000 to 2021. And we have monthly price observations for about uh, for 2,300 markets in 71 countries uh, for a grand total of about 1.3 million price observations. So it's a fairly large data set uh, with spatial properties, of course, because each of these is tied to a market. Um, so you'll see in the figure on the left here, uh, the breakdown by food group of uh, 2017 US dollars per thousand kilocalories by food group. So of course there are differences. You can see that breads and cereals are trapped in about 99% of markets, um, whereas meats and uh, fruits and vegetables, for example, are trapped in fewer, far fewer markets uh, compared to the others. Um, and each of these uh, average price prices have different trends across different data sets. Um, yeah. And we also are considering, as I mentioned, five different types of climate shocks. So we're looking at flood, drought, storm, heat wave, and cold wave, each of which has a different definition. But every single, uh, every single extreme weather event here is spatially matched to the market and month of price observation based on the GPS coordinates of the market. So, a uh, lot of data between both the price observation and the climate, um, and there's a lot of coincidence between those. So here is a map of the markets that we're looking at. Uh, this is most relevant to this audience, I think. So as you can see, there's a lot of emphasis on food price monitoring in low and middle income countries, particularly in Africa and Asia. Uh, one of the data sets, the FUSE, uh, FUSENET data set, is limited to some key sub-Saharan countries, the, the green points here. Um, so that data is only available in some countries compared to WFP-VAM, which is available in a lot more countries. Um, and of course, there's a lot of selection bias in you know, which observations, uh, which observation markets are established and why. Um, as you'll see, you know, North and South America have very few points um, 
and there are very sparse observations, you know, throughout uh, throughout large uh, sections of the continents. So we had to make a lot of spatial decisions. Um, the first of which is framing whether there's an underlying process here, and the answer is yes. So we know that retail prices are observed in some markets, uh, but most the price dynamics and you know uh, price determination laws hold true even in unobserved markets. So we're dealing with a biased sample, but still you know a reasonable sample. Um, we also had to ask you know how many neighbors do we want to consider? So for any kind of spatial analysis, especially with point data, you have to look at uh, how many neighbors do you reasonably want to you know include to consider nearest neighbors or proximity metrics? Um, and there's no clear answer for it, for this question yet. Um, so you'll see here, you know, it makes sense to include maybe up to five nearest neighbors, whereas in India and parts of Africa, it might be, we might only need to include two or three. Um, so there's differences in space uh, over that decision as well. And finally, the, the biggest question uh, for spatial analysis is what do you drop? What do you keep? Um, a lot of these uh, markets, there are very few observations, right? So we have to decide which markets we want to keep, uh, whether to keep orphan observations or, you know, with uh, observations in very limited uh, regions, whether to even retain them at all uh, to derive meaning from this data. So no results yet, but a lot of questions still. Um, we are interested in exploring uh, you know, wholesale retail markups, and that involves pairing markets. So you have to figure out what the closest wholesale market is to your retail market. Um, and that introduces uh, another challenge to this work, which is, you know, not all wholesale and retail price observations are not available in all markets at all times. Um, so one alternative to that is considering distance-based thresholds. So distance to near a city, for example, or travel time. To New York City uh, as potentially a proxy for that. Um, there's also the changing combination of market item and price for each time point in each market. Um, so data is not consistent. Uh, there, there are a lot of missing missings throughout the study period. Um, we do have to figure out a way to deal with that. And finally, temporal lags. So uh, just because a price is observed in one location uh, does not mean that it's not related. Uh, it might be related, uh, you know, three months later. Uh, the price, yeah, there are a lot of changing temporal dynamics with, uh, within price trends in markets um, that we would like to take into account using temporal lags. Um, but whenever you introduce both spatial and temporal lags, uh, modeling becomes a challenge and the packages that can handle that um, are, are limited. So there will be a learning curve. Uh, for that uh, part of the research question. Great. Um, so the moderators asked me to talk a little bit about the lessons that I uh, have taken away from my work in spatial statistics so far. Um, so here are some key takeaways. Uh, and again, these are highly subjective, uh, just based on my own experience here. Uh, but starting with a clear outline of your outcome and covariates helps a lot. Um, having a clear research question, um, and I think Samita would agree on this, right? We, um, across all projects, it helps a lot to know which variables you want to explore from the start. Uh, in terms of research techniques, um, I would advocate bookmarking interesting data sets um, and just store them for future analyses or future projects. Um, I ended up using a daily flood product data set very recently that I just bookmarked away um, just because I thought it was interesting. Um, I'd also recommend building up your own skills uh, through independent learning, uh, skills in data management, data mining, and so on. So we've all uh, received, you know, we've all had some experience with this during COVID-19, I think, but the resources to learn these tools and techniques are all available. They're, they're all open access. So you really don't need to wait for a course or, you know, a structured kind of learning experience to kind of build your skills up. And I think it was, um, this is a surprisingly valuable skill to have, especially if you want to work with crowdsourced data or data that's warehoused away or behind a paywall. Um, it, it certainly helps to be able to, you know, know how to retrieve the data you're interested in. And finally, learn by doing. Uh, I wish there, there are a lot of, you know, avenues for this uh, within academia as well as, you know, out in the, uh, in the professional settings as well. But 
um, learning really is a snowball effect. So uh, at the start, it seems difficult and dreary, but uh, you know the the gains improve uh, very quickly here. So uh, after the tipping point, it gets easier, and you become well versed enough in the concepts to you know uh, to pick it up very quickly. Uh, and finally, in terms of logistics, you know, just document your data decisions um, if possible. You know, keep a keep a log in every folder to kind of document your decisions. Um, and you know, the the most important audience for your work is you six months from now, not necessarily someone who's going to read your paper. Um, so make sure you know you are able to retrace your steps, um, and you can keep reproducibility in mind. So maybe someone else following along can do the same. And finally, uh, there's a lot of new data out there um, and spatial data is becoming more and more ubiquitous. Um, this data is of course very detailed. I think I saw a remote sensing data set that was you know, at the 15 centimeter resolution uh, very recently, which is very, very high resolution um, to be able to detect from space. So you know, this data is uh, high resolution available at multiple spatial scales. So, um, you know, just a few years ago, very few cities had GIS portals for the public to be able to download and map their own data, but that is becoming more and more common. Um, and in fact, now it's considered the norm. So uh, in parallel, there's an explosion of, you know, auxiliary unstructured data that's being generated by really anyone with a cell phone, right? Passively generating a lot of location-based information. And really that was, the, um, that was the source data for you know, Google mobility trends or Apple mobility trends. Um, I was looking at mobility patterns during COVID-19. Um, so these data are constantly being generated, of course, but passively, but also actively in the social media space. Um, and there's a lot, of, you know, a lot of analysis, a lot of sentiment analysis and spatial analysis to be done there. So um, yeah, there's a lot to be done. And spatial statistics is of course one of the many toolkits you can use to begin making sense of all this big data. So with that, I'll share some resources uh, and then end here. Thank you so much. And I think we're ready for questions. Thank you, Ash and Samita. Um, so now we can open up to questions. And if anyone from the audience has a question, you can feel free to put it into the chat. Um, or raise your hand or simply just turn off mute and go ahead and ask. I can start off with one question. Um, so I know there are many tools and programs available for spatial statistics and you had listed a few on your final slide, Ash. And I know at the Tufts Data Lab, there's many sessions on GIS, um, R, Python. And so I'm just wondering what, uh, for both Samita and Ash, what's your package that you normally go to? Um, and how do you choose between all of the different packages? Well, uh, maybe I'll start first and then Ash can provide more details. Um, so I, the course that I teach on spatial stats, for which incidentally, Ash was the first TA for the course when I taught it, um, we start out with relatively easier, easier to, or lighter software like Geoda. I'll type the uh, software name in the chat. But if you Google it, it's very um, easy to install. You can uh, get it for both Macs and PCs, so the operating system problem is not problem. Uh, it's free and you simply have to have one shape file, which is a sort of GIS type data set. That is, you can map it. You can start out by mapping it. And then if you remember the slide where I showed you this typical progression of making charts and then maps and then trying to see if you can develop hypotheses, that's really a useful um, software to start with. Then it, and this depends on everybody and everybody has different sort of comfort levels with different software. I also highly recommend R because again, it's open source, but you do need to sort of have a more programming mindset. So you have to have this understanding that you are creating variables and setting them and then running it. And so it's more code-like in a sense. So you, 
I would say if you're not comfortable with code beforehand, then probably R wouldn't work for you initially. But I think one of the things that I want to mention is that even sort of commercial software like ArcGIS, for example, if you've heard of that, it's a popular or, well, actually, uh, it's the big market leader. I'm not sure if it's popular uh, software in GIS. And they have started incorporating so many of these tools. So there's a lot of spatial statistics you can do within that. And they've also built bridges to R and Python. And so you can connect to software like PySAL. Uh, well, it's not, I wouldn't call it it's a software. It's a package in Python that you can import and then do stuff with. Um, if you thought, if you think R is bad, Python is a, uh, even worse in terms of your ability to understand the programming, you need to be pretty up there to be able to deal with all the pain that Python brings, which is still worth it because it is, you know, it's open source and you will get better at it eventually. And it's worth it if you want. I'm thinking of the mountain that uh, Ash just showed us. So it's, you know, if you're willing to climb that mountain, then you'll have enough momentum and you can go down the hill over any other hills that come in the way, whether it's Python or R. Um, so, that's my sort of uh, brief attempt at saying where to start. Ash, anything you want to add to that? Yeah, just to yeah, just to uh, further advocate using R for R if possible or Python. Um, you know, again, open source resources are so readily available, and all you need to do if you run into any issues is just you know ask Stack Exchange, and um, and someone will help for sure. So in addition to R, I've also recently been working with Stata, um, which you know is a paid software with a lot of um, with a slightly different way of visualizing data uh, than I think R or Python. Um, but if you're interested in spatial econometrics, that is certainly an option. But um, yeah, I'm also adjusting to the transition between R and Stata uh, recently. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, if no one else has uh, any questions from the audience, we can ask another moderator question, but feel free to, to, to speak up or uh, put a question in the chat if you have one. Um, one question is from your own research, how have you used GIS and spatial statistics to explore topics related to diversity, equity, and inclusion in nutrition or public health sciences? Well, I would argue that I think most of the time that's what I'm doing, right? Uh, when I, if you recall the example I showed you of the city in India called Chennai, where we were looking at how is energy expenditure different? Uh, well, that was really about equity. Uh, the wealthy are definitely spending a lot more on energy, which uh, makes sense. Uh, but it's also located, it's also differences within a city in terms of where they are located. So the northern parts of the city, even the wealthy who live there are spending less on energy. And so that could be something to ask. And because they're spending less on energy doesn't mean that's a good thing it could also mean that they have no access to places more jobs or amenities and so uh, that could be a sign of you know differences within the city in the way infrastructure is placed uh, same thing with um, opioid uh, use disorder i mean uh, like i said we're we thought that we would see a lot of thing of that happening in western massachusetts but then it turns out to be it's again mostly uh, predicted by lack of infrastructure. So uh, I would think that's a path to pursue for us and we are doing that in future. So maybe it's it's something more inherent, I mean, structural inequities in which we lack access to jobs, which make us perhaps, you know, depend on other things like substance ab abuse. And so uh, I would say, I think as a planner, um, policy, somebody who would like to advise on policy, uh, this idea of mapping something is a really easy way to figure out what the inequities are within places uh, or within countries or regions and across countries or regions. So um, I'd say that's a much easier uh, first step 
in that mountain that we want to climb, where we want to get to equity. Uh, sorry, I keep bringing back ashes visual again and again. Uh, that, that map could be an easy way of getting some momentum. And there's a question in the chat. Um, can you comment on how difficult it is to implement spatial statistics in the context of a Bayesian framework? Ash, you want to start with that? I don't, I have not attempted to use spatial statistics, um, even the Bayesian corrections and so on. So yeah, please feel free to take this. Um, I think there is a lot more work now than there used to be. Um, there's at least one textbook that I recently bought on spatiotemporal Bayesians. Um, it is possible. I don't know how easy it is. Uh, it is uh, it's definitely in the beginning stages when compared to some of the other things that we talked about, uh, both Ash and I. Um, even within software like Geoda, though, we are seeing some uh, sort of... Uh, already created ways in which we can sort of test for uh, rates using empirical base types of smoothing. So some of that has been already inbuilt, but it's definitely not quite. So you definitely have to be the one who, who can work with Python and uh, several packages in R and put them together to be able to do this. It's not going to be a point and click software that's going to help you with this kind of um, sort of understanding of the Bayesian framework. Okay, great, thank you. Um, one other question I had is, there's a lot of opportunity to um, use spatial statistic methods to study how climate changes are impacting human outcomes. Uh, but one of the challenges is the granularity of survey data. And uh, when you link uh, climate changes like flooding to survey data, oftentimes the survey data is not granular enough. And I'm just wondering if there's a way to get around that or um, what what you've seen in your work and how 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 you might do those linkages. Uh, I can attempt to answer part of this. so, yeah, it is challenging. So at least in my experience, the, the harder part is, you know, downloading either climatological data, um, which is very hard to do if you're, you know, working uh, on a personal laptop or so on. So uh, I think the computational challenges and the data storage challenges um, are, are far more than, you know, the actual code or extract function that you have to run to, to get the data. So of course it's easiest when you have um, point data uh, associated with your survey. So if you have you know, GPS coordinates or at least even a radius, um, I know DHS, for example, is publishing radii uh, so to, to protect confidentiality and so on. So even a rough estimate of location is certainly helpful. Um, but yeah, unless the, the sources of the data, you know, warehousing uh, curators uh, publish that information, uh, in my experience, uh, I've had to go out and download the data, extract it, um, and then, you know, compile the covariates and so on to use it. Um, yeah. Well, I, the only thing I'll add to that is that uh, uh, while it is hard, it's much easier than it's been in the past. So you have a lot more downscale data for many of the different scenarios and you can get all kinds of bioclimatic variables, again, downscaled so you can really, so for one of my students is looking at how it might affect Jamaica and how it might affect specifically transportation infrastructure in Jamaica. And Jamaica is really small compared to say the US. Uh, and still she was able to use that downscaled idea to get a good sense of where the uh, vulnerabilities are. So uh, while it's, hard, it's definitely easier than it used to be. Absolutely. Uh, can you mention, Samita, a little bit about the spatial resolution? I think in my work, I think I'm dealing with 30 meters, for example. Um, was that student able to use, you know, high resolution? 
Uh, I'm not sure how high the resolution is. I just put in a link to the data that she's using. I'm not sure it's any better than 30 meters, <laughs> to be honest. But it's better than it used to be when Jamaica was one big, you know, like pixel. One pixel was Jamaica. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay, great. Thank you. And we have one um, other question in the chat. And I'd also like to just be mindful of the time. It's currently 1.53. So I'll give this uh, last question and then um, give participants uh, or the audience opportunity to join us for the next session at the top of the hour at 2 p.m., which will be the student oral presentations. Um, but we can just wrap up with this last question, which is um, for people who work more on the food intake and nutrition side, um, are there any recommendations or places to look for geotag data? Yes, I just put in a link to the DHS spatial data repository, um, which I found very useful. Um, I think all available, you know, coordinate shapefile information for any available, you know, more recent DHS rounds um, is warehoused there if you're interested. Um, there are several other links to, uh, you know, uh, compilation covariates and so on um, that I can also look into. Um, and check them out. Okay, great, thank you. These are really good resources. Um, and I think all of this, right, Ryan, will be available on the website? Okay. Yep, everything will be posted on the website in the coming weeks. So we hope uh, you will all be able to check it out there. Um, an email will go out uh, once it's up, uh, which will be wonderful. And um, we hope you'll you'll join our next session. And, and thank you so much, uh, both Samita and Ash, for being able to come and talk about a topic that I know lots of folks are interested in, but may not have a lot of avenues to be able to talk about. So this was fantastic. Thank you.